Hello once again and welcome back to Lawrence Plays Factorio Space Exploration and Crastorio 2 for part 3 of this week's update. And in this one we're going to take a bit of a look at how uh, things have been going on with spaceships and going off to distant parts and taking a bit of a look at the Iridium and what's been going on with exploring pyramids and the like. So let's start off by talking about spaceships. Uh, Mike has been doing some a little bit of experimentation and a little bit of rescuing with the uh, with the spaceships in the last stream. So as you may remember, last week he managed to strand the deep space exploration ship somewhere in the spatial anomaly. So you've got at the moment we've got this 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 is the uh, local galaxy. We've got various asteroid fields and stars and so on and so on. But there is also the, the anomaly Fenestra, which is sort of separate and it's the same distance from every absolutely everywhere and you travel there through the spatial anomaly which means you can use it as a shortcut to travel long distances and I did the maths a little while ago and I discovered that going from Kalidus to Stardust would be ever so slightly more efficient going via Fenestra so probably going from Kalidus to Timagus would actually be less efficient but if you're going any further than that then it's definitely worth doing it. Mike has been going all the way up to Melancholia up here, and so that's very, very worth going. It would, it would take, I don't know, probably an actual real-world day to fly from Kalidus to Melancholia the old-fashioned way, and I don't know if you'd be able to cram enough fuel into the spaceship to do so. However, if you go via Fenestra, then you go from here to sort of outside the universe, and then back in again over here, and so when, as you go in and out of the spatial distortion, you can end up anywhere you want. And when you fly to Fenestra, you leave whatever system you're in, and then you go in, immediately you go into the spatial distortion. You don't do any flying around in deep space in this sort of area and so Mike was interested to test whether if you flew just it just into the spatial distortion and then immediately flew back out again with a target of somewhere else whether that would mean you wouldn't need to fly all the way to Fenestra and whether you could magically teleport very very quickly for the price of keeping a bit of an eye on the ship or going through a much much more complicated uh, programming and so he tested this and it turned out that exploit is not available <laughs> if you go into the spatial anomaly but don't get all the way to Fenestra then if you come when you come back out again you end up in the place where where you originally were. So if you tried it from, say, Kalidus, you go into the spatial anomaly, and then you come immediately back out again, trying to go to Melancholia, but you pop out here at Kalidus, and then start to fly across like this. And so that didn't work. And in a way, it's sort of a relief, because it would make getting around a little bit too cheap and easy. But, you know, on the other hand, it would make getting around extremely cheap and easy. So that would be quite nice. So it was worth it was worth a try. So the rescue mission was one of those multi-phase things. So uh, Mike flew the, the uh, Nexus ship from, uh, from Norbit out, out of Kalidus system, and all the way over to Melancholia, via Fenestra of course, to pick himself up because he was sitting there uh, building things and just wait waiting for stuff to happen. And then from there he flew out through the uh, spatial distortion field to get to where the deep space exploration ship was and landed right next to it and then sort of did the, did the traditional build up a little sort of lump of land on the side of it and then pumped some extra fuel across into it so that it was able to start flying again. Once he'd done that it was then perfectly usable again so he was able to carry on. It looks like the deep space exploration has now arrived in Melancholia. It's not docked here yet. It's just, this presumably has got a load of useful stuff in the chests on it. Yeah, there's loads of belts and underground and, and bits and pieces. Presumably this is all the sort of stuff he reckons he's going to need to set up additional mining systems out here. He's forgotten the beacons once again and rather more seriously, I think he might have forgotten the mining drills and you're not going to get very far trying to set up a mine if you don't have any mining drills. But, you know, it can always go round and round again. It's not the end of the world. It just takes a bit of time to fly it around like that. Meanwhile, Mike also flew over to Brunus, which is another star system, down here in over in the sort of the, the left hand side of the of the galaxy. And he built up the now familiar enormous rectangle of solar panels with a dimensional anchor tacked on next to it and some uh, meteor defense guns and, and a little bit of ammo as well. So this was just, this was a relatively easy drop it in, basically do the blueprints, just build the thing. Now, I mean, I'm sure it took him a while because this is a huge area of solar, but it's now, it's now fairly familiar and it's, it's something we've done a number of times before, so I won't harp on about it any further than this. Once he'd done that, he then returned all the way back to Melancholia to carry on with some of the stuff I've been talking about earlier in the weekend, you know, carry on getting this area set up. And now that he's got the uh, deep space exploration ship over here with all the bits and pieces he's going to need for these belts and so on, then he's going to be able to get at least get this area finished off. And then hopefully he can start thinking about going and setting up some more mines. Because I'm I'm optimistic that we're going to start using the Naquium again fairly soon. So, it, it, But eventually, hopefully, we'll just we'll get this area running as fast as it can and then we'll start needing more Naquium mines. And it'll just carry on it growing and growing as factories do. 
This meant the uh, Nexus was now free to be sent all the way back to Norbit, where it docked and is now trying to fill back up again with all of the uh, all, all, all the scaffolding and all the solar panels ready to go out to another solar system and set up another anchor. So, yeah, as you can see, this is quite an expensive process in bots. We're losing quite a lot of them to, uh, to robot attrition. They're all crashing over here and all the way over here and... There's, there's, a, there's an awful lot of dead bots around, is what I'm saying. But uh, but we do need... Oh, there was one crashing just then. But we do need to have an enormous amount of uh, scaffolding over here. And to be fair, bots are pretty cheap. So yeah, I don't really like it, but I don't really know how else we could do this. In the last video, I took a bit of a look at the Graphimatron and said, well, the Iridium seems to be doing quite well. It's filling up its bar over here. I guess a spaceship has just arrived. And to be fair, and it, it is true, there is quite a lot of Iridium up here. And as, as you can see, we're unloading a load of it from the, uh, from the warehouses here. Topping these ones up, we've got uh, an amount in there. Up here, we've got a, mo a mostly full warehouse. So we've got quite a decent, quite a healthy amount of Iridium up here. So this is why you can see the bar growing down on the graph. So yeah, this, is, this isn't doing badly at all. Um, but we did see some, some unexpected behavior. Oh, and as you can see, we are getting through quite a lot of Iridium, so all this has been brought in. We'll have to keep keep a bit of an eye on this, try and see how it's keep, how well it's keeping up against the uh, against the demands of the factory, because we are getting through a lot of it, and I'm not 100% convinced we've managed to fill up all the buffers yet. But it is kind of flowing through nicely, and things are, I'm pretty sure, things are improving. In the production graph, we've seen some interesting shapes so I would like to think that some of these dips are because we filled up on the amount we've got on the amounts we've got so we're, we're completely full and therefore we don't need any more but some of these dips are a little bit weird and we, we saw some of these happening live and we certainly weren't full at the time uh, but we couldn't really work out what was causing them it seemed to be some sort of maybe it was just some sort of throughput issue or we're not really yeah we're not really sure why we're getting some of these dips but we can see that over the last 10 hours we've been using quite a lot more than we produced but over the last hour we produced quite a lot more than we've used so it does look this does suggest we are filling up buffers at the moment and the last 10 minutes is probably even healthier yeah there we go produce 972 a minute using 806 a minute it's not even healthier but it's doing pretty well that is a bigger number than that one and that's what matters i'm cautiously optimistic that the iridium production is fast enough and we just need to keep let it run for a little while as we fill all the buffers up and then everything should be hunky-dory and we could even maybe even get a train sat here and indeed over on kothar the process seems to be working we've got quite a lot of, uh, in fact we've got a lot of crushed iridia, iridite stored in these warehouses, a lot stored in these ones over here as well, so these are, these are the ones where it's all running from, uh, and then there's a certain amount of um, iridite in here that's waiting to be crushed, that's being pumped through as it's available, but as I say we've got lots of it, it's all being processed through here, so I don't see any shortages here. Up here I do see some red lights flickering, uh, and that's a we're not bringing the crushed iridite in fast enough, so that, to me, suggests we need to upgrade, do some belt upgrades. We've already got green belts coming in here, so maybe it just means it's straight up too many machines. But then over here, we've also got too much iridium powder trying to come out, so again, again perhaps some more belt upgrades needed over here. I don't know, because we, we seem to have, we have two green belts coming out of the top here, but they're not full, so this balancer here doesn't have enough coming into it to keep the entire system satisfied. But I think maybe some belt upgrades in here would help a little bit, would get that flowing a little bit faster. Uh, and then up here, well, we're, we're happily dealing with all of the uh, the powder that's coming in. We've got a little bit more headroom up at the top, so if we did have faster belts, we'd be able to deal with a bit more of it. And then there's all of the, the blast cake coming out over here to, to this systems, these systems. And this, to be honest, this all looks fine. I don't I don't see any problems here. Let's have a look at some of the other things that are being fed in. So we've got the, the um, nitric acid. It's pretty full, looks very steady. The uh, hydrogen chloride, even fuller, and again, looks very steady. So this does seem to be okay. And then presumably it'll all flow over to here. We'll get it put into the trains over here. There's plenty of room in this warehouse, so I can't imagine this is ever going to fill up, and at least not, not until we've had a chance to build up a lot more of it. And so I can't see any sensible reason why the, um, why the production of Iridium has been having the issues it has. It, it is a bit of a mystery, and... Um, yeah, I don't know. Because the, the, we got these, these large backlogs over here. Actually, this one's nearly empty now. Well, I say nearly empty. There's, a, there's half a warehouse here and there's... Um Oh, well, see, actually, this... Ah, because there's control systems on here, that's cut off the supply that's going through here to go to... Um, oh, oh, it's being fed over to these warehouses. <sighs> I don't know. Mike has wired the whole thing up very, very strangely. It, but there is there is a lot of crushed iridite around here, so I would I don't don't really expect there to be any problems with it. All the other intermediates seem to be okay. We've got loads of the red beads coming down here. There doesn't seem to be any sort of problem there. We've got there's a little bit of a gap there, but I mean that's just a tiny little gap. There's plenty of all the resources coming in. It it all looks good to me. Mike has said, however, that he did, did discover a um a bit of a throughput issue, and that was up here in in orbit over uh, over Kothar. And the problem was that he'd ordered 
with too much elevator cable. So you can see it's got jammed up here. The idea is that everything pours out of the spaceship over here. It will then go down the belts and it'll come over here and it'll be loaded into the train. However, if you've got too much elevator cable like this, then it will block the belts up and then your uh, your vulcanite can't get through and your enriched vulcanite can't get through and your rare metals can't get through. So this, I suspect this is probably the cause of the issues we've been seeing. And then after a while, we'll pull through enough elevator cable up here to keep the elevator running that this will be able to flow for a bit and then that'll allow things to start working again. But at the moment, this is a fairly severe problem. I think this, this needs some fixing get done. And it looks like a start has been done here by Tristan. Uh, and with this, we'll be able to put in another two chests up here and just play play past the parcel, past, past the cable around the around the outside here a little bit as well. Um, and that will allow us then to maybe, maybe stop ordering quite so much of elevator cable and then things will calm down a little bit and they can maybe start working. But because we don't have the bits and pieces we need in order to do this in, in orbit here, somebody's going to need to go out and give it a kicking and get it to start working again properly. Mike says he has fixed this in um, in scare quotes by by adding in a, um, a con an extra r rule on the train that tells it to go down after 40 seconds no matter what because it should only take 35 seconds to fully load, uh, depending on the stack size of things being put in, but it, it is sort of vaguely sensible. The problem is, this this would sort of fix it if, there was a, if, if one of these belts was running, but because they're both blocked by the cables here, that's not going to work. His best bet, if, I wonder, are there any... Is, is there any robo system up here? I don't see. I don't see any robo ports. But I was thinking, if you if you if you tell it to dismantle those, then yeah, no bots will come out to get them. What I was thinking is, if we could rip up these bits here and just dump all those cables into a yellow chest somewhere, we could then put these bit undergrounds back in again. And that and if we do that, we might have to do that sort of three or four times. But then hopefully that would be enough just to start pull this through and start the belts running again. Um, unfortunately, there are no bots here. There are there's no robo ports. There's no yellow chests. So that's not going to be that's not going to work. It's just going to have to wait until someone comes out here and gives it a kicking. And the risk of this is that we're going to run out down here on the ground, we're going to run out of rare metals in whichever one's a rare metal station. We're going to run out of, eventually we'll run out of enriched vulcanite. We've already run out of vulcanite. We've already run out of rare metals, I suspect. It'd be one of these three. Uh, and so, yeah, so that means the system will gr will eventually grind to a halt. Uh, there, there will be a bit more buffered down here somewhere, but this is going to cause a severe iridium shortage. So I think this needs to be quite high on the list of things to go and, uh, and give a good kicking to and try and sort it out. Here's a train coming looking for some rare metals, and it will wait here for a full cargo inventory or just nothing happening. Oh, nothing happening and being partly full. So yeah, it's just going to wait here forever now and we'll, and, uh, we'll never get any more rare metals to wherever they're needed, which means no more nitric acid, which means no more uh, no more iridium. Now, as I say, there's, there are buffers that we have to empty yet before it'll actually be a, a, a total disaster, but it's only a matter of time until that happens and then we start to have problems over here. Just to add insult to injury, there was also a train jam somewhere on the planet which caused a vulcanite train to not manage to get it and get to where it would, it would do the drop off and therefore the system ground to a halt. Uh, that was apparently um, due to a train limit having been unset on one of the stations. Um, Mike says it was quote unquote, become, it had become unset for some reason. So he obviously thinks he had set it initially and somehow it had got unset. So um, goodness knows what was going on there. Shortly after, Tristan discovered a, a train down, a rare metals train down here that had run out of fuel. So he managed to refuel it by putting in, um, oh I see, by, by, by splitting off some of the fuel from up here onto this belt, bringing it down here um, and then shoving it into the train with a convenient belt over here. So it was actually, this is quite a good place for the train to run out of fuel because it was relatively easy to bring some over and could all be done from the navsat without needing too much in the way of extra belting. Of course, these bits of belt can now be removed. We don't need these anymore. The bots have done their, done their bit, job and filled, filled the train back up and the train's gone off and started working again. And this is the uh, the rare metal storage area that I was talking about earlier. There's still 28,000 here, so that's going to keep us going for a while. I'm probably more going to be more concerned about the Vulcan. Well, actually, we seem to have... Yeah, there's about 12, 15,000 of Vulcan. Oh, no, another 50,000 Vulcanite over here. Okay, so I think we've got a decent amount of time to get over and fix the problem. But the problem does need to be got over and fixed. So, yeah, we don't want to, don't want to leave that for too long. This next chapter is going to talk about um, archaeological stuff and puzzles and endgame stuff. Uh, so once again, if you don't want to hear about any of that stuff, then uh, feel free to skip forward to the uh, to the next chapter, which is all about what research we've done. Um, but, you know, a little bit of a, uh, a spoiler up front. Uh, there wasn't much research. <laughs> so now let's, uh, let's have a look at things that are mildly spoilery. So Tristan carried on bimbling around the universe, going off to the various planets that had got the pyramids on them and, and giving them a poke, slaughtering the biters and stealing the modules. So he went to Narsus Minoa Amachania Dedrim 
Charon and Toxinora, from where, which he got an efficiency module, three productivity modules, and two speed modules, which, you know, that's quite a good haul. But more interestingly, Dedrim and Charon both had cartouches in them that matched the predicted layout. So we've got to the point now where we've explored enough of the universe that we can start to make guesses as to what symbols are going to be on the cartouches in planets we haven't explored yet. And it was quite nice to discover that the two that he went to, where predictions had been made, the predictions were correct. So it looks like we've at least sort of understood how the cartouches link up together. We haven't really got onto how they'll link onto the actual end solution yet, but we've got some vague ideas about how they how they how they fit together. Tristan has also expanded his diagram of the long-range star mapping data, as you can see here, and that X that's floating around in between some of the blobs there is the position we were given in the ship's log when we went over to investigate it. That's the one you see here. This is the uh, the log from the ship we found out in Fenestra, and there is this number in the middle here, which is a vector along the same lines as the ones we've been finding from the long-range star mapping, and so it made sense to plot that onto the same sphere. And as you can see, it nestles in amongst the other areas we've found. It isn't bang on top of any of them, which is perhaps a shame because that might have been useful, but also it's in, in, in clustered amongst them. And we haven't worked out exactly what we're going to do with that information yet, but still, it's a nice thing to know. It's another thing we've worked out and discovered. And so I thought, I thought you'd appreciate seeing it. And so to finish off, let's have a quick look at the research that was performed in the last stream, shall we? Well, we did a grand total of absolutely nothing. So we, um, we've had the Mining Productivity 13 sitting there in the queue for the whole stream, and I don't think we actually made any progress on it at all. And that was, as I, as I was saying in the first video this weekend, uh, because we didn't have any of the advanced science packs coming through here, and it needs those, and we don't have those because yada, 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 all the way up the tree. It's an immersion problem. We'll try and get that fixed, and then hopefully that means that next week we'll, I'll be able to report back that we've finished off this research and got on with some other stuff as well. And so that brings us to the end of the video. It's been a little bit shorter, sorry about that. Apparently I didn't have quite as much as to say as I thought I did in this third part of this week's shenaniganry. But never mind, we'll be back tomorrow with the stream, so we'll be carrying on sorting out all the problems I've been talking about this weekend, and wow, I've got quite a long to-do list this week. <laughs> I'll then not be back on Wednesday. There will be no stream on Wednesday because I'm going to it's because it's show week and I'm going to be in the theatre again. I'm not actually on stage this time, but they need me to push buttons and make sound effects and things like that. So I'm afraid I won't be around for the Satisfactory stream this week, but we will still be doing the Monday Night Factorio stream. And because we're doing a Monday Night Factorio stream, that means there can be some videos at the weekend as well, so there'll be Friday and Saturday, and if once again I can't stop talking, there'll be one on Sunday as well, and you know what I'm like. So, please make sure you're subscribed, like the videos, all that sort of stuff. I hope to see you next time. Thank you very much for watching, and bye-bye.